Well, good morning, and thank you to the Alaska Children's Trust for hosting this webinar series, and thank you, everyone in attendance, for joining us today. Through this series, we hope to share the results of the 2019 Alaska Youth Risk Behavior Survey, or YRBS, and provide information on how these results are used throughout Alaska. Finally, I'm grateful to the Tobacco Prevention and Control Program, Christy and Katie, for being here with me today and talking about how YRBS data have helped their work. The YRBS program is led by Dr. Andrea Fanati and Taslina Mannix is the YRBS data manager. I have been with the YRBS team for a little more than a year and continue to learn from our partners. So thank you for sharing your experiences and work. Today, we're going to briefly introduce the YRBS and look at key results and trends from the 2019 survey. You will then receive information on what is being done in Alaska from our subject matter experts and partners in TPC. Our webpage, also listed at the bottom of this slide, may be found at yrbs.dhss.alaska.gov. In the resources section of our website, you'll find a link to the YRBS partner video. May we ask again to please consider playing the YRBS partner video in waiting rooms, meetings, and events so that we may spread the word on how YRBS, are YRBS results are used in Alaska's communities and the importance of participation. Established by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, and first implemented in Alaska in 1995, the YRBS is a voluntary school-based survey administered to high school students in grades 9 through 12 in public schools across Alaska. Student participation is anonymous, voluntary, and requires written parental consent. Students in traditional and alternative high schools in Alaska complete the survey in one 45-minute class period at school. The YRBS is administered every other year in odd numbered years and in 2021 will be administered in the fall due to a number of reasons, including the uncertainty of in-classroom instruction, burden on school districts as they respond to the extraordinary circumstances of COVID-19 and because we have determined that high quality data collection is not feasible for the current academic year. We remain committed to collecting and sharing important information about the health of Alaska teens, and we are asking for help in making the fall 2021 YRBS administration successful by encouraging high participation rates in, in your communities. Alaska is an active parental consent state by law, which means that parents are aware of the survey and we help by providing resources so they may make informed decisions. However, if there is a low parental permission form return rate and low participation rate, there could be a low overall response rate. Therefore, we have to work a little harder in Alaska to ensure we get good data. In fact, the return of the YRBS permission slips is critical to the success of the YRBS. The survey includes questions on the topic shown here. This quarter's webinar focuses on tobacco and tobacco products, including electronic vapor products and substance use perceptions from the 2019 YRBS. Through YRBS results, we can identify behaviors among youth causing the most important health problems, determine prevalence of health risk behaviors, in particular emerging, emerging issues, assess how risk behaviors change over time, compare results geographically, and even identify health disparities. Statewide and even local results are available if enough districts, schools, and students have participated. We provide results of the survey, programs throughout Alaska, use and interpret the results to better understand the strengths and needs of our youth. Digging into YRBS results can help inform strategies, policies, and programs to reduce unhealthy behaviors and improve teen health. Some of the ways YRBS results have been used are listed here. Alaska also unveiled new data dashboards in 2020. The dashboards provide commonly used YRBS measures, which is especially useful for those of us who like data but are not data scientists. 
If you haven't already explored the dashboards, you may access them through our homepage. Just click on 2019 YRBS results to access traditional and alternative high school results and local results may be accessed here too. Most of the information in this presentation is taken from our data dashboards and is available from wherever you can connect to our website. To learn more about using the dashboards, check out these links to November's Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion webinar series presentation, during which the YRBS data manager, Teslina Mannix, provided an introduction to the new data dashboards, which may be helpful as you explore 2019 YRBS results. We hope that you'll find the video helpful to navigate these important results and trends. If you need help in navigating these dashboards or need additional information, please feel free to contact us at wirebs at alaska.gov. There were 14 questions on the 2019 YRBS that directly related to the use of tobacco and tobacco products and how they were obtained, as well as four questions on perceptions of cigarettes and electronic vapor products. We've selected a few of these important measures and let's look at the results. The dashboard provides two measures, the percentage of students who ever tried cigarette smoking, even one or two puffs, and the percentage of students who ever used electronic vapor product. We'll look at them together. This chart shows the percentage over time in students who have ever tried cigarette smoking. The gray line with circles is that line. And the students who have ever tried electronic vapor products is shown with the blue line with triangles in each chart in this chart. There's been a decrease since 2007 in students who have had ever tried cigarette smoking, even one or two puffs. However, an increase in students who had ever tried electronic vapor products since 2015. This pattern was also seen in national results. These next charts are directly from the YRBS data dashboards, which may be found on our website, yrbs.dhss.alaska.gov. Titles on the charts provide the wording of the question. Blue squares are all students. Gray triangles are female students. And orange circles are male students. The dashboard provides a table and indicates whether there is a significant long-term trend from the first available data point or a short-term trend since 2017. Note there has been a long-term and short-term decrease in female and male students and overall. In this chart, gray triangles are white students and orange circles denote Alaska Native American Indian students. Note that there has been a long-term and short-term decrease in students who have ever tried cigarette smoking, even one or two puffs, except were highlighted since 2017 in white students. There has been an increase since 2015 in all students and in females who have ever used an electronic vapor product, but not in males. There has been an overall increase since 2015 and by race in students who have ever tried electronic vapor products, but no significant change since 2017 by race. The scale in this chart ends at 60% to show the significant difference in Alaska Native American Indian traditional high school students who had ever tried cigarette smoking, even one or two puffs, all students, male students, and female students. Comparing by race and or sex offers an opportunity to consider disparities in our outreach efforts. Our dashboards also provide information on prevalence by grade and age. 2019 Alaska YRBS results showed that in a classroom of 30 traditional high school ninth grade students, a little more than six had tried a, a cigarette. And 12 out of 30 traditional high school ninth grade students had used an electronic vapor product ever. When looking at the results, we see that there was a decrease in having ever tried cigarette smoking since 2007 and since 2017 with, a, with differences by race. By the first year of high school, a concerning percentage of students have tried cigarette smoking. 
There's been an increase since 2015 in traditional high school students who have ever used, had ever used an electronic vapor product. There was also an increase since 2017 with differences by sex. And by the first year of high school, 40.5% had ever used an electronic vapor product. The dashboards provide another two measures, the percentage of students who currently smoke cigarettes and the percentage of students who currently use an electronic vapor product. We'll look at them together here. Here we are again comparing US results, or here we are comparing US results to Alaska results. The percentage over time in students who currently smoke cigarettes are shown by the gray line with circles and the students who currently use electronic vapor products are shown with the blue line with triangles in each chart with the US on the left and Alaska on the right. In both Alaska and the United States, there has been a decrease in students who currently smoke cigarettes. And here we see that current use of electronic vapor products has increased since, has increased since 2015. Students in national results had a higher prevalence of current electronic vapor product use, 32.7%, compared to Alaska traditional high school students at 26.1%. Note that there has been a decrease since 2007 in all subgroups, <clears throat> but no significant short-term changes in students who currently smoke cigarettes, including by sex nor by race. There has been a long-term and short-term increase in all subgroups of traditional high school students who currently use electronic vapor products. This chart shows trend by sex and similar trends were seen by race. And in a classroom of 30 traditional high school ninth grade students, seven currently used electronic vapor products. And changing gears a little, there is another measure in the YRBS dashboards that provides the percentage of students who currently use tobacco of any type. And by the ninth grade in a classroom of 30 students, nine students currently used some type of tobacco. To recap, in Alaska traditional high school students, there was a decrease in teens who currently smoke cigarettes since 2007 and in all subgroups. No significant change since 2017. 2019 results showed differences by race and in ninth grade students, 29.7% currently use tobacco products of any type. Looking at current use of electronic vapor products, there was a higher prevalence in the US and or in national data, an increase in Alaska since 2015 and 2017. And in ninth grade students, 22.8% currently used electronic vapor products. Finally, 29.7% currently use tobacco of any type. In the YRBS data dashboard, we are provided the measure percentage of students who smoked their first cigarette before the age of 13. There has been a decrease since 2007 in all subgroups of traditional high school students who have smoked a whole cigarette before the age of 13 and in all subgroups, but no significant change since 2017 in subgroups either by sex or by race. And we see that there were more Alaska Native American Indian than white traditional high school students who have smoked a whole cigarette before the age of 13. Again, this information is important when trying to figure out where to set um, priorities when we're planning outreach. In a classroom of 30 students, about two students have smoked a whole cigarette before, eight, before age 13 for the first time. There was a decrease since 2007 in students who have smoked a whole cigarette before age 13, but no significant change since 2017. We saw a difference by race and in 2019, 6.5% of traditional high school ninth grade students had smoked a whole cigarette by the age of 13. In the following two measures from viewing the YRBS dashboards and looking at the confidence intervals in the table, there were no trends to report and no subgroup differences. In 2019, the YRBS asked students how they obtained their electronic vapor products. Among those who used electronic vapor products, a little over 45% usually got their electronic vapor products by borrowing them from someone else. 
we saw that a little over a quarter of traditional high school students were in the same room with someone who was smoking cigarettes on at least one day during the past seven days. This measure can help us to understand the prevalence of potential exposure to secondhand smoke. The Alaska Wire BS includes three questions related to students' perceptions of harm from substance abuse. In a classroom of 30 traditional high school ninth grade students, 17 think there is great risk of harm if they smoke one or more packs of cigarettes per day. 13 students, shown by the gray lungs, do not share that perception. In a classroom of 30 traditional high school students in Alaska, eight, just eight students, think there is great risk of harm if they use electronic vapor products every day. 22 students shown by the gray lungs do not share that perception. This was a new question in 2019. Here we want to see increases over time. Unfortunately, there has been a decrease in the percentage of traditional high school students who think people greatly risk harming themselves physically or in other ways if they smoke one or more packs of cigarettes per day. This was seen in females and males and across races. And significantly fewer Alaska Native American Indian students, 43.9% than white, 67.6% students perceive great risk of harm from smoking. Almost 90%, 89.9% of traditional high school teens think their parents feel it would be wrong or very wrong for them to smoke cigarettes. And that's really important because at the national level, we learned that teens reported that parents are the greatest influence on teens' risk behaviors decisions. 21 out of 30, 70.4% of teens, thought that their friends felt it would be wrong or very wrong to smoke cigarettes. That's nine in a classroom of 30 traditional high school students who don't have that same perception. 2019, I'm sorry, so we saw that 45.1% borrowed their electronic vapor product from someone else. The contrast in traditional high school students who thought that there is great risk of harm if they smoke one or more packs of cigarettes today with differences by race and those who thought that there was great risk of harm if they use electronic vapor products every day. That about 90% think their parents feel it's wrong or very wrong to smoke cigarettes, whereas about 70% think their friends feel it's wrong or very wrong to smoke cigarettes. And teens report that parents have the greatest influence over their risk behavior decisions. We've covered a lot, but there's more to explore. I hope you'll visit our website soon and please encourage everyone who can to participate in Alaska's 2021 YRBS and to watch and share the YRBS partner video. We rely on our partners to share why these results are important to Alaska. We share YRBS results, but our partners dive into the data a little more deeply. The Tobacco Prevention and Control Program recently shared their newest tobacco facts about Alaska teens and e-cigarette use on their website. And with that, I have the pleasure of passing the rest of the presentation to Christy Knight and Katie Steffens from the Tobacco Prevention and Control Program. TPC has been incredibly supportive of the YRBS program and provides support to communities and organizations throughout Alaska. They'll share how they used YRBS results in their work and their new fact sheet. Well, thank you, Gina, for that introduction. Um, as Gina mentioned, my name is Christy Knight. I'm the program manager with Tobacco Prevention and Control, and I'm here with Katie Steffens, our new deputy program manager. Um, so today we're going to introduce our new campaigns and resources to support parents and school staff when talking with their teens about electronic cigarettes and related health concerns. So this presentation is designed to increase understanding of how um, our program took the data and applied it to our projects. We have two parts. We'll overview the need that we saw in the community, and then we'll overview how we applied that data to community education. So this is a bit of a busy slide, um, but the, the Tobacco Prevention and Control Program follows the model outlined in CDC's 2014 best practices for comprehensive tobacco control programs. Uh, the model drawing on the literature in tobacco prevention and control has four primary goals. And you can see those highlighted here on the screen in our logic model. 
Uh, it's to prevent youth from starting tobacco use, protect the public from exposure to secondhand smoke, promote quitting among youth and young adults, and identify and eliminate tobacco-related disparities and achieve health equity. And you can see at the base of this model is surveillance and evaluation. The, the YRBS is an example of a surveillance system that really helps us monitor our progress in um, applying these evidence-based strategies in tobacco prevention and control. Uh, I think we have a request to zoom in. Um, And I think, unfortunately, we will not be able to zoom in uh, to the slides because it isn't a slide deck, but you will be receiving a copy of the slides at the end of the workshop today. Thank you, Thomas. Um, so next slide. So while we've seen a continual decline in youth use of cigarettes, e-cigarettes have been on the rise since we began tracking in Alaska's YRBS uh, in 2015. So you can see cigarette use uh, as the blue line, and this is all students who currently use cigarettes, and electronic cigarettes are in the red line, and you can see a significant increase. Um, the encouraging part about this slide is that uh, the steady decline in cigarette use does tell us as a tobacco prevention and control program that efforts are working, these evidence-based strategies are working in Alaska, and these new and emerging products are on the rise, but we will apply the same strategies to address that use. So as of 2017, only 7.5% of students, so about 8% of students use combustible cigarettes, but 26% of students currently use e-cigarettes. That's roughly uh, one in four uh, teens are currently using e-cigarettes. Next slide. As of 2019, only 28% of students had ever tried combustible cigarettes, but 46, so nearly half, have ever tried electronic cigarettes. And then as Gina mentioned earlier, the 2019 YRBS also demonstrated that students have a lower perception of harm uh, related to e-cigarettes. So some of the reasons that we've seen this increase um, and this rise in e-cigarettes um, it's been advertisement toward youth, uh, and we have an image here on the screen of an example. Uh, there are youth-friendly flavors. I believe here we have a picture of a flavor called Candy King. And then also these products do contain nicotine, um, and nicotine, of course, is highly addictive. Um, so you can see here on the slide to the right, the cigarette pack uh, has a dual pod, which is the pod that you would put in the device in that advertisement picture to the left. And that one pod, so that, uh, that one little pod has the same amount of nicotine as that pack of cigarettes. So they do have quite a bit in some of those products. So we'd like to thank our partners at the American Lung Association for sharing this picture. Um, American Lung Association provides education and training to communities and schools about all tobacco products, including electronic cigarettes. And these are, this is a picture of products that were uh, found during a routine locker search uh, at a school in Alaska. And so staff found juices, accessories, devices, uh, and they came in many different shapes and sizes, as you can see from the screen. So it's very important that educators and administrators know how to identify these devices so that they can talk to teens about them. So along with the American Lung Association, the Tobacco Prevention and Control Program uh, funds 23 community grants. Um, and again, I think this is small print, so uh, when this goes out, we'll just make sure to send a link to our community grantee site as well. Um, we also have four contractors who provide statewide interventions. And again, a big focus of these programs is providing community education on the products so that we can address that perception of harm um, that we see. And then also they implement evidence-based strategies to reduce youth use, so tobacco price increases, uh, smoke-free policies, tobacco-free school policies. And so through their work implementing these policies and working with their communities, uh, we had a lot of an anecdotal information um, that the needs in schools had significantly increased and teachers were requesting more training and more support as they saw an increase in use on the campus. 
Uh, we also were approached by a parent teacher association who uh, asked for more information about these products and, and information so that they could assist uh, in talking to teens. And so nicotine, in, 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 youth are particularly vulnerable to the effects of nicotine. Uh, nicotine negatively impacts brain development in teens. And the cognitive and behavioral impairments from nicotine use include making it harder to concentrate, learn, and control impulses. Nicotine is highly addictive and it can also lead to dual use of tobacco products such as then using e-cigarettes and then also using what we call combustible cigarettes. Um, e-cigarettes create an aerosol, so it's not water vapor, and that contains ultrafine particles, heavy metals, volatile organic compounds, and flavorants like diacetyl, which causes popcorn lung. And in high enough doses, nicotine can be a poison. So while these products are still fairly new, uh, we are still learning the long-term effects, uh, but these are the effects that we do know in relation to youth and the impacts that it would have um, for youth to use nicotine. Um, protective factors are individual or environmental characteristics, conditions, or behaviors that reduce the effects of stressful life events. These factors also increase an individual's ability to avoid risks or hazards and promote social and emotional competence to thrive in all aspects of life now and in the future. And that's a definition from CDC. Alaska students, as you can see on the slide, who report having protective factors or supportive characteristics are less likely to use electronic cigarettes. These factors include not feeling alone, feeling like they matter in their community, and having teachers who care about them. So by increasing protective factors in our communities, we can help build resilience in Alaskan youth and support them in making positive health choices like not using tobacco. By encouraging productive and safe conversation between adults and teens, we anticipate an increase in protective factors for teen. Long-term outcome, we anticipate that increased protective factors will contribute to improved teen health outcomes. And so we really saw a need between the information we were getting from the grantees, what we were seeing in YRBS, uh, to really create resources for parents and adults in teens life to empower them to really have, you know, understand what these products are, their health harms, and, and show them ways that they can have supportive conversations with teens about the products. Next slide. So this is an image uh, from a resource that we launched following the review of this YRBS data, and it'll tie into Katie's presentation in a, in a bit. Um, we launched Live Vape Free, uh, which is online, uh, online learning opportunity for parents, guardians, any adult really who would like to uh, support teens in not using tobacco products. And they're self-paced learning experiences, and they're really designed to empower people to be quit champions for the youth in their lives. Um, so people can follow this link if they're interested in enrolling and taking these classes, learning more about the products and how to talk to teens. Um, by following the link on this slide, myquitforlife.com slash AKLVF, and that stands for Alaska Live Vape Free. And these courses are free for community members and parents. And now I'm going to hand it off to Katie Steffens. Hey, great. Thanks, Christy. So yeah, after Christy, um, had mentioned, we heard these community needs for education around youth e-cigarette use in Alaska. And having the comprehensive data that Gina just took us through earlier, we knew we needed to create some resources in which the data could tell a story of what was actually going on with this epidemic of youth e-cigarette use we were seeing in Alaska. And we also knew we needed to educate communities on how to address this. So I'll take us through three projects we've been working on and some have been completed already. Um, and our first one will be our e-cigarette fact sheet. So next slide, please. Thank you. So our e-cigarette fact sheet was recently updated uh, to address the general public. We created this uh, largely based off of the new YRBS data we received from 2019. Um, and this sheet includes information on what e-cigarettes are, uh, what their health harms are when they're used. Um, it also has the updated 
YRBS data and trends from previous data collected. And um, another section we're excited to have on uh, there is strategies for partners, decision makers, and schools on how to address this e-cigarette use epidemic. Um, and we've also included useful resources uh, that people can check out as well. And that is currently available on our website. And thanks. Uh, our next project I'll talk about is our e-cigarette uh, campaign that is geared towards parents. And um, we wanted to create this because we needed some more partners in our community who could reach youth. And those partners, we wanted to be parents. So we had three goals when we first started to plan this campaign. And those were to educate parents on Alaska teen use of e-cigarettes, encourage healthy conversations with teens about e-cigarettes and productive conversations, um, and also provide parents with resources that they could use when talking with teens, such as Live Vape Free. And I'll go through a little bit on how we created that campaign. And so to create an informed campaign, we utilized focus groups to better capture and understand parents' understanding of youth e-cigarette issues in Alaska. And so for our focus groups, we recruited from regions with the highest prevalence of youth e-cigarette use in Alaska. And these regions were the Gulf Coast region, the Southeast region, and the Anchorage Matsu regions. And due to the pandemic, we hosted these groups through Zoom rather than in person, which ultimately benefited us because we were able to reach more people in smaller communities all at once. Um, and uh, I, I don't think I mentioned before, but we, we knew these regions had the highest use from our regional reports that came out of the YRBS survey as well. And next slide. And so the goal of uh, our first round of focus groups was to determine parental knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs related to youth e-cigarette use in Alaska. So we utilized YRBS data shown on the right here to capture a baseline understanding of this issue and build a second set of data from these focus groups to create messages and tests during the second round of groups. Uh, from this first round, parents expressed a need uh, of more information on how many teens used e-cigarettes, how to identify the products, uh, what are the health harms, and how teens get the products in the first place. And next slide, okay. And for our second round of focus groups, um, we created seven different storyboards based off of the first round of focus groups to test during the second round. And from these discussions, we were able to select two storyboards that parents from these focus groups found the most helpful and turn them into public service announcements, which we will show now. The first one is eSig 101. or maybe we'll show it later. <laughs> E-cigarettes or vapes can deliver high concentrations of nicotine. They can also have harmful chemicals. E-cigarettes come in many shapes and sizes with a lot of flavors that are appealing to your teens. Regular nicotine use can have harmful effects on your teen's developing brain, affecting memory, learning, and attention span. They can even lead to addiction. One in four Alaska high school students vape. Parents, talk to your teens about using e-cigarettes. Help stop an addiction before it starts. Great, so that was the first PSA we created. Thank you, Gina. And this is our second one, Too Easy. Hey guys, so I didn't really know how bad vaping was going to be for me. It was always so easy for me to get e-cigarettes for my friends. But then I started to need them. And when I started to get my own, you wouldn't even know. You would have thought that this was a thumb drive, lotion, or a marker. They're easy to get and easy to hide, but not so easy to quit. My mom's coming. Parents, talk to us about vaping. You can help us stop an addiction before it even starts. Hey guys! 
And so those are airing now in um, a lot of regions throughout Alaska. So if you see them, let us know what you think. Um, we appreciate the feedback, good or bad, so we can build better messages in the future. Um, and then now I'll go into our third project, which is currently under construction. And um, this is an e-learning e module that the Department of Health and Social Services and the Department of Education and Early Development are teaming up on. Um, and this is created primarily for teachers and school staff across Alaska. And participants will learn about what e-cigarettes are, how they become widely used among youth, their health harms, comprehensive tobacco-free school policies, alternatives to suspension, and they will also provide resources for schools, parents, and uh, cessation resources for teens as well. Um, and it'll also have interactive components, including videos and activities like identifying e-cigarette products and accessories among common everyday items like you see in this picture here. And these, this module will also be accessible by the general public too. Okay, so I just wanted to give a quick um, thank you and shout out to our partners and grantees and coalitions and especially our YRBS team and Gina. Um, all of our, our partners and grantees do such great work throughout Alaska and uh, do a great job of utilizing the data um, and just promoting the work that our uh, tobacco prevention and control program aims to achieve. So thank you. And we also have some additional resources listed here, including the American Lung Association's How to Talk to Your Kids About Vaping. Um, and this is a great conversation guide for parents on how to have those productive conversations with your team. We also have our own Alaska TPC resources. Um, I had linked the strategic plan in the chat. Um, and we also have our annual report and tobacco facts document. So thank you all. Um, and if you have any questions for our program, you can email Christy Knight at christyknight at alaska.gov. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> well, thank you so much to our presenters. What we'd like to do now is open the uh, floor for any question and answers. If you have uh, any questions you'd like, you're welcome to put them in the Q&A chat box, or you can also uh, raise your hand and that will signal me to take you off mute to be able to ask your question. It looks like we have one in. Uh, from Olivia, can you elaborate on how you are working with schools to offer other ways to deal with youth vaping besides suspension? Katie, did you wanna take that and talk about what you're doing with the module? Sure, yeah. So. Um, in the module I had talked about, we're really trying to emphasize alternative to suspension programs. And what those are, are programs intended to, instead of kids getting suspended for having products or using them on school campus, instead they are um, sent to an educational classroom or you know time where they can learn about these products and the harms and hopefully it'll motivate them to go in to look into quitting these uh, products as well. And um, we're also looking into suspension rates in Alaska and related to tobacco use and hoping to provide extra support in those communities who are seeing higher suspension rates too. Great, thank you, Katie. Um, also inside of the chat box, you'll see there's a link to this survey uh, for the evaluation. Please go ahead and make sure to fill that out. Um, so that helps us just improve and strengthen the series and find out other questions you may have as well. Uh, others, any questions uh, or comments that you have in regards to today's presentation, feel free to either put it in the chat box. And I see another one come through. This is from uh, Vera. This is how many ethnic groups does the Alaska data on vaping and tobacco use cover? That might be a Gina question. Sure. So thank you for the question. And um, you know, the answer really is it depends on participation. With high enough participation rates, we can um, represent um, more ethnic groups. Um, but right now uh, you'll find that, and in fact, I can even bring up our data dashboards. We have information on 
um, of course, white and Alaska Native American Indian. But then also, can everyone see this? Okay. Yeah, yes. Great. So I'm going to go into the traditional high school data dashboards. And you can see that we have um, listed Hispanic. Um, and we also have something called all other races. And I'm just going to go to a tobacco measure. And because we're talking about electronic vapor products, we'll go to current electronic vapor product. And we'll see that we have American Indian or Alaska Native, Black or African American, Hispanic or Latino, white, all other races and multiple races. But if there's a data flag, it's that be that's because we didn't have a high enough participation rate from that demographic group. Does that answer your question? So, so the bottom line is, um, please encourage parents to let their uh, youth, their teens participate in the YRBS. We want everyone to be represented. We want to be able to share this kind of information and we wanna be able to provide programs and organizations who are doing outreach, the kind of data they can use to be able to um, decide what the best use of their resources are so that they can target. And again, feel free, uh, any questions you're welcome to put in the chat box. Looks like we have another question here. Um, are there any plans being made on how to increase student participation for completing the YBRS? Our participation, participation rate has been low and the usable data is not available. That's a great question and thank you for asking that. Um, there are, of course, we've, we've begun school outreach, but we've been careful right now in COVID, in the COVID-19 times, they are responding to um, just um, extraordinary times um, in reaching youth. So we are reaching schools. We are asking our partners. And in fact, um, I have to give a shout out to Will Herr, who's coordinating um, to help us develop a better plan to reach partners to figure out what we can do. So things that you can do are, um, if you're a partner, you can develop a um, letter of support for the YRBS and we can share those. Um, if in your community you've used YRBS data, communicate that to us, specific to the community that you've used the data to provide outreach programs in, um, because that's really important. Um, people want to know, is it, is it helping my community, right? Um, and then also we, um, we are going to have a list of partners who are willing to support the YRBS um, by, uh, with the schools, if schools ask for assistance, so we can link you up with schools. Um, and the other thing is market the YRBS, show that partner video if you're willing, um, in your waiting rooms, at your meetings, wherever you can, so people know that the data are important and they do make a difference in Alaska, um, having results, that we can use make a big difference and um, and help us to reach teens. Thank you, Gina. Uh, other questions? And again, feel free to also raise your hand if you'd like to take yourself off of mute, just raise your hand or you can put it in the chat box. I did put both Gina and Christy's email as well in the chat box so that way you can reach out to them after the webinar if you have some additional follow-up as well. Uh, uh, Charlie in the chat box put, he's using uh, uh, statewide youth events as well. Uh, and we'll give a moment to see if there are any other questions that come through in the chat box today. And maybe if I could also ask while we're waiting for any other questions, uh, Katie and Christy, if there's any uh, examples of communities that have been taking the campaign that you were talking about, the vape campaign and being able to put it into practice besides just the, the PSAs playing, but if you have any examples of uh, how communities are kind of locally using those resources, would be great to share as well. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. So we do, our grantees do have access to the design files. So once we launched the campaign, uh, our media contractor provided technical assistance to grantees to adapt the media so that they could then share it in their communities, uh, which, which they've been doing. Um, I don't know if I have a specific um, grantee. Katie, uh, if you had any thoughts, you're welcome to, to jump in. But 
uh, we're sharing these information so that the uh, grantees can then use it in their work with schools and with community members. Yeah, and I can add, we had another campaign related to e-cigarettes developed before last year called Not Buying It. And uh, there are a number of social media posts grantees could use or posters. Uh, they could also put their own logo on and put up in their communities, whether it's in schools or their workplaces or um, public areas as well that help get that information out. And that's still a continuing campaign as well that we're building on. Great, thank you. And I'm not seeing any other questions come through, so we might end a little early today. Uh, before we do though, in the chat box, you'll see a link to the SurveyMonkey link. That's our evaluation for the workshop. As part of our continual uh, improvement process, we always like feedback as to how we can strengthen this webinar series. Uh, our next webinar will be March 25th from 12 to 1 p.m. Uh, and it will be focused on alcohol um, and the YBRS data around that, as well as the state of Alaska's uh, campaign Ooh, gee, I'm going to forget the name of it off the top of my head right now because I should have had that one pulled up. <laughs> uh, it is the Alcohol uh, Safety Action uh, Safety Action Program, uh, ASAP, uh, that will also be shared and highlighted. So tune in on March 25th, and I'm going to go ahead and put that uh, link as well into the chat box too. If you want to get registered and get that on your calendar right away, you can. Um, but without any further ado, I'd like to uh, thank our presenters today uh, from the state of Alaska, uh, Gina with the YBRS uh, uh, State Surveillance System, and both Christy and Katie then with our Tobacco Prevention Program. So thank you so much. And I do see actually we had a little typo there. We have our evaluator there, not Katie. Katie <laughs> is our presenter today. But thank you so much for partnering with us in the Alaska Children's Trust and the Alaska After School Network on getting this valuable data out. We're going to encourage you all, uh, feel free to reach out to us too if you have any other questions. Um, you're welcome to stay on a little bit longer. We'll keep the, uh, the webinar room open uh, to be able to share out any other information. In the chat box right now as well, I'm putting in, this is the registration link for the March 25th uh, from Data to Practice series focused on alcohol and the Alcohol Safety Action Program. Uh, so feel free to register for that. Without any further ado, thank you so much. And please uh, give our presenters a round of applause on the chat box. <laughs>